Good morning, Grace. We want to welcome you once again. I hope you had a great Christmas. My name is Clay. I'm one of the pastors along with Mark. If we haven't met yet, it's uh, nice for you to meet me. I guess I'm not actually meeting you, but we're glad that you're joining us for another Sunday morning where we get to look at God's Word together. Now, the last couple of weeks, we took a little bit of a break from our series in the book of James, and this week, Mark is bringing us back in to chapter 5 of the book of James. So we're really excited about that. But before we get into that, one of the things that we've been loving to do as a church throughout this, the last couple of years actually, is going through a catechism. So we start at the beginning of the year with question one, go to the end with, uh, it's supposed to have 52 questions. We're actually gonna be doing question 51. So you guys can catch up on question 52 yourselves at home in between this week and next week, because next week we're starting on question one again from the start. So I'm gonna read the question and then you get to read the answer along with me. So if you want to do the study of, of all of these questions and answers, uh, you can go to newcitycatechism.com. Yep, just double checked it, newcitycatechism.com. That's where you'll find the information. That's where you will get to find the catechism that you get to do yourselves at home for the last one, the 52nd question and answer. And just so you know what this is, it's questions and answers derived from the scriptures that help us understand what it is the Bible is telling us about who Jesus is, what he's called us to do, and how we live in light of the truth of the gospel. If you don't know what the gospel is, it's the amazing good news of what Jesus has done for us. He lived the perfect life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. And he rose again, victoriously conquering our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell, so that we could be brought into the family of God, brought into the kingdom of God. And it's just amazing that we now get to be united to God where he lives in us as we carry on in life. And this just is the best news ever. And that's why we celebrate it week in and week out. And we do this as a church together, not just individually. And so as a church, one of the things we love to say is that our mission is to love people, love Jesus, and help people love Jesus. And we want to continue doing that. So without any further ado, let's do the catechism together. Question 51. Here's the question, and I'd love if you read the answer along with me. Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension? So if you don't know what the ascension is, that means after he died and he rose again, he ascended up to be with God the Father, meaning he, he rose up in the air and kind of disappeared. But he's there ruling and reigning. And now, so here's the answer of what advantage it is for us. And please read along with me. Christ physically ascended on our behalf, just as he came down to earth physically on our account. And he is now advocating for us in the presence of his Father, preparing a place for us, and also sends us his Spirit. So this is part of the good news, where God sends us his Holy Spirit to live in us and to allow us to become more and more like Jesus through what's called sanctification. So I'm hoping that we get to rejoice in the good news of Jesus again today as we listen to the sermon that Mark's going to be bringing for us in James chapter 5. But before we do that, let's pray and set our hearts right to hear from God's word. Father, I thank you so much that you, through your work for us, Jesus, you bring us and have brought us into the kingdom of God. I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts through your spirit to change us to be more like Jesus to change us to recognize what it is you're calling us to, to change us, to help us to appreciate you more, to love you more, and to deepen our relationship with you. Thank you that we can have a relationship with you. I ask that you would continue to work in us and through us to make your name great, to make much of yourself, and to bring us the greatest joy that we could ever have. I pray all these things in the amazingly beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's hear what Mark has to say. After the sermon, there will be a few songs for us to sing together. Whether you're at home alone or you're home with family, sing along, sing loud, and enjoy worshiping Jesus because he is worthy. Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome to our online gathering. Thank you so much for joining up with us this morning. I really hope that you've had a wonderful Christmas as we were reminded during this season again of the birth of Jesus. I hope that the good news of Jesus is what gave you peace and joy this holiday season. So my prayer is that this uh, good news of Jesus Christ just continues to give you hope as the new year enters 
Now, this past couple of weeks here at Grace Warman, we've been uh, going through some Christmas-themed messages. And today, uh, we are going to dive back into the book of James, where we left off uh, three weeks ago, I believe. We left off in chapter 5 in the book of James. And so this week, we're going to get back into chapter 5, and we're going to be starting in verse 13, and we're going to take all the way to verse 18. So if you could turn with me to that passage, James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18, I think you're going to find it very helpful to follow along. In this passage, as we go through it, uh, you will find the book of James near the end of the Bible if you have a paper copy. If you have a digital copy, an app on a device, you can just use a search function. You should be able to find the book of James that way. So we will play these verses out on the screen for you. You can follow along with that, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go through this text in James chapter 5 together this morning and see what God has for us to learn about him through this passage. Reading from James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. All right, so let's just open up with a word of prayer before we dive into this text. Father, I just want to say thank you for this passage of scripture that you have given us. And I thank you for giving us this book that was written by James so that we could know more clearly who you are and how this knowledge of you ought to change the way in which we live. As we've been going through this book, we've seen that knowing you changes everything about us. It changes how we view and use our, our time, our friends, our money and possessions, and changes how we how we live in real tangible ways, it changes how we interact with others. And I just pray that you would help us to see clearly how this knowledge of Jesus changes who we look to for help and encouragement. And it help us to see how it changes who and what we worship. And I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so just a quick little word on the context of this passage to bring you all back up to speed after a couple of weeks away from this passage, or from this book, I should say. This passage was written by one of the early church leaders in Jerusalem. His name was James, as you might have guessed from the title of the book. He was the half-brother of Jesus, and it was written to a church that had been scattered throughout the region. The Christian church, it had started in Jerusalem, but with all the persecution from the ruling Romans and the religious Jews, many of the people had been scattered throughout the region to many different cities and towns. And so this is the church that James is writing to, the scattered church. So this letter from James is sort of like, you could say us, a recording our sermons on a sun for you to watch on Sunday mornings during this time when we cannot gather physically. It's very similar. This would have been a similar thing to writing a letter to all these people so that they could receive the message from James, even though they couldn't gather physically in one home location anymore. Now, keep in mind, these people, they were in some serious hardship. Much of what James writes is written to help this church focus um, or to take their focus aw away from the difficult circumstances and to help them see the good news of Jesus Christ and, and what a great reward they have in him. They don't need to look to their earthly circumstances in despair. They have eternal, everlasting, and abundant inheritance in Jesus Christ. They should look to that. If they have repented of their sin and followed Jesus, if they believe in him and have faith in him, then they can be assured that no matter how difficult this life is, it is so much more than worth it. The reward for a life spent uh, following Jesus will far outweigh any negative experiences here on earth. So James just encourages them. He keeps pushing. He says, keep going, keep the faith, keep your focus on Jesus. He will do as he said. He's saving you. He is setting aside an inheritance for you. It's all yours if you have faith in him. And so live like this is true because it is. And this is the message of James. 
And that's where we enter our text this morning, verse 13. He says, if, is, anyone su- is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Now, <laughs> this verse really sets the tone for our passage today. Every verse in the passage that we are going through today mentions pray or prayer. It's a major theme of this passage today. If you're suffering, pray. Pray to God that he might help you through the suffering. He has the power to do it. Pray that God would teach you more about him through the suffering. Pray that God would help you identify with the suffering of Jesus on the cross that was ultimately caused by you and me so so that you might know him more deeply and the price that was paid for your sin. Or maybe you're in the opposite situation. Maybe you're cheerful and full of happiness. Well, then rejoice in this gift that God has given you. Praise God for the moments of joy and peace and happiness that enter your life because they are a gift from the Father. The suffering is a gift as it draws you closer to Jesus and to God the Father and the good times are a gift. A blessing from the Father to help you see his wonderful generosity. So James's point here is that no matter your circumstances, good or bad, talk to God. He wants to hear from you. He wants to communicate with you. He wants prayers from you with requests for help. And He delights to help us as a father delights to help his children. And he he gave us the ultimate help by sending Jesus to the earth to pay for our sins so that we could have eternal life. We were sinners in need of a savior destined for eternal suffering. And he heard mankind's cry and saw our need for a savior. And he delighted to help us and deliver us from eternal suffering. So he has already given us this amazing gift. And so if we are cheerful about this, let's praise him. If this life has treated us well, let us look to God and offer him thanks for all that he has done for for us. Praise him. Worship him. We can be cheerful and full of joy because God the Father did answer our ultimate plea for help. And he did fulfill our ultimate need for a savior so we can celebrate. He heard our prayer for help in our ultimate suffering of sin and death and he sent his son to earth so that we can celebrate with joy as we did this Christmas season and be filled with peace. So let's praise him. Communicate with God in your suffering and in your plenty. He wants to help and he loves to see his children full of joy when he does help. So talk to him. How many of us actually do that? Do you talk to God when you need something and praise him for the times when all is well and taken care of? Or is our time of prayer something you do to just tick the box in the morning or maybe in the evening? Does Jesus fill your thoughts and your mind throughout the day or does he just fit into a compartment for a certain time of day? Keep in mind, he is always with you if you are a follower of Jesus. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with us every step of the way, every day, all the time. God in us, with us. Now, imagine... If your spouse was with you all day when you went to work and when you went out with your buddies and at home, everywhere you went, your spouse was there with you. Now, also imagine if you would only speak to him or her for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day. You said your piece and that was all throughout the day. And they were by your side all day, but no communication. That would be weird. This is not a relationship. This is not communication. It, like imagine if I came home from work and never said a word to my wife because I had already spoken to her for 10 minutes in the morning before work. That, that's not how relationships work. When you are together, you communicate, you think of one another, you're in step with one another. And this is what it's like to be in right relationship with God. He is always there. You might not always be saying audible words to him, but you always know he's there. You are communicating regularly throughout the day. And the more time you spend together, the more you know him and the more you become like him. And this is what James is trying to get across in this passage. Are you suffering? Pray. Are you happy? Praise him. Be in communication with God. He loves you enough. So much, in fact, that he sent his son to die for you so that you could commune with him. So spend time with him. Pray to him. And James then, he goes into a very specific example of prayer during a prayer, and it's prayer during suffering. There are many forms of suffering, you could say, from financial distress to mental stress to physical ailments or broken relationships, mental health, whatever it might be. But he specifically addresses the suffering of sickness in the next portion of our passage. Verse 14, he says, Is any among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let, him pr let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So James, he just reinforces the fact that they ought to pray in their suffering. Are you sick? Ask for the elders of the church to come and to pray over you and anoint you with oil. Now, what we assume from this passage is that these people who were ill are too sick to gather with the rest of the church. If they could get together with the church, this is where they could be prayed for. This is where they could be encouraged. This is where they could be built up. However, when one is too sick to gather, then it is on that person to act out in faith. They ought to reach out to the elders of the church so that the elders know of their condition and they are to then, the elders are then to come and pray for the one who is gravely ill. In faith, the sick ought to call the leaders of the church to pray by faith to God on their behalf. And these leaders of the church are to anoint the people with oil and pray. Now, there are two things in this passage that are maybe a bit controversial and have caused some confusion in the church in recent history. The first thing in, is in this verse right here in verse 14. It is the anointing of oil. Now, we understand that if a person is gravely ill, so much so that they cannot make it to the gatherings of the church, they ought to call the elders and the elders or the leaders of the church are to pray for that person. That part is just easy to understand. We get that praying to God for the healing of the sick is good and right. But this anointing of the oil, it seems kind of strange to us. What is the significance of the oil? What is the purpose of it? Now, keep in mind, I consider this maybe somewhat of an open-handed issue, but I'm going to give you my opinion on the significance of the oil based on what I think I see in scripture and what many of the commentators that I have read would also uh, agree with or what they also have seen in scripture. Now, some think that this anointing with oil in the New Testament indicated some spiritual significance uh, representing the Holy Spirit's power upon that person. And I guess this may be the case. In the Old Testament, the, the anointing with oil was done for kings or priests, and it also extended to a few other offices, signifying the fact that these people were chosen for God's purpose, and God's Spirit would rest upon them when they had been anointed with oil. In the New Testament, however, we find that the Spirit now resides inside each believer already. It is one of the huge blessings of being on this side of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ we get the promise of the Holy Spirit. So the anointing with oil is likely something different here. We already have the Holy Spirit. So I find more likely that this anointing of oil was a medical treatment. We find that often this oil in the New Testament, um, the Greek word used here is in this passage, it refers to olive oil specifically. It would be used for medical treatments. For instance, in Luke chapter 10, in the story of the Good Samaritan, we find that the Good Samaritan anointed or poured oil and wine on the wounds of the one who was injured or sick. Oil was also thought to cure the plague in ancient Egypt and was considered good for treating wounds and different sicknesses. It was sort of used like, I guess you could say, say the, the castor oil of the New Testament times. 30 to 40 years ago, people used castor oil for just about everything from just treating skin conditions to using it as a laxative and an anti-inflammatory, curing arthritis. You name it, castor oil could cure it. Uh, th this is sort of the same idea of the olive oil during the New Testament time. It was a medicine that was good for everything, you could say. So what I think James is communicating to these people is that if they're sick, they ought to pray in faith for healing but they also ought to seek the best medical attention. They ought to use all the natural means possible, but still pray and ask God for supernatural healing. Because whether it is healing by natural means or by miraculous means, both of those means come from God and both are a blessing. God has created doctors and scientists who are smart enough to develop medicines and treatments that are designed to help the human body heal. And God has created all the substances that go into these products. And so these God-given gifts of medicines and doctors and hospitals ought to be used as a gift from God. So pray. It may be that God heals you through health care. It may be that he performs a miracle that healthcare cannot explain. Either way, do what you can in faith, knowing that God is in control the whole time. Whether God chooses to heal you here on this earth or not, know that you will experience ultimate healing in eternity. Not one of us can escape physical death. We will all experience it someday, but it is not the end. 
our ultimate healing, our new bodies will be unveiled when we see God's kingdom in its fullness, face to face with Jesus. And, and that's where we move into verse 15. And here in verse 15 lies the second controversy in this passage. Verse 15 says this, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, some people take this verse to mean that if someone prays for you in faith when you're sick, that God guarantees that you will be healed. They take this verse to mean absolute guaranteed physical healing if someone prays over you in faith. And this idea leads uh, to a conclusion that if you pray for someone and they are not healed and their sickness continues, or perhaps they even die, then either you, the one who is praying for the person, or the one who was sick, did not have enough faith for healing. Now, many of the prosperity type, or prosperity gospel type preachers and churches use this passage as a proof text that you can name and claim healing whenever you wish, if you just have enough faith, if you just believe hard enough, then God will answer your prayers with a yes and he will heal the one who is sick. Now, I do not hold to this view. I certainly believe that through prayer and the prayers of those who are faithful in the church, that people can be healed physically and miraculously. I certainly believe that God listens to his children. He cares, and there are times he chooses to heal someone in this physical world in the here and now. But I don't see that guarantee when we study the whole of scripture. There are most certainly times when God chooses to heal either through natural means of doctors and hospitals and medications or through miraculous means. And at those times, we get a, a blessing. It is a blessing to witness such healing and such grace and mercy towards us, that God would do that for us. However, if you can remember back to the book of Hebrews that we went through several months ago, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says this, it says this, and just as is and just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. So we see in Hebrews that mankind is appointed to die. So if everyone who is sick or injured was healed every time, no one would ever die. There still comes a time that we must die, whether through sickness or injury or whatever it might be. God doesn't answer every prayer for healing with a yes, otherwise we would be immortal, you could say. It is appointed for man to leave this body behind at some point and pass on to a life with Jesus face to face if he in, indeed is their savior. This is where there will be ultimate healing, new heavenly bodies and eternal joy in Christ. This must happen. Earthly healing is just delaying the joy that we will experience in seeing Jesus face to face if we are truly one of his children. You see, Jesus came to earth that we might have our sin paid for. He died to pay for that sin and he rose again so that we could have life with him. And this is fulfilled in full when the earthly body dies and we pass on to our heavenly home. And so if we are are truly people of faith, if we really believe this, and we are praying for those who are sick, those who are deathly ill, then our faith gives us this knowledge that if the sick person dies here on earth, they truly get ultimate healing. So when I read verse 15, and, and where James says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, I see it as something so much more than physical healing as that miracle of physical healing is a short-lived and decaying miracle, as we will all die again physically at one point anyway then. So I see verse 15 as eternal healing, eternal life. If you have faith that Jesus is your savior, that he is the one who paid for your sin, and that he is the one who made it possible for you to spend eternity with him, then you will receive healing far beyond any earthly healing, and Jesus will raise you up. He says this in John chapter 6, verse 36, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus will raise us up. The prayer of faith guarantees salvation in Jesus and healing for eternity. 
Jesus is the one who promises to raise up all those who are his on the last day. No more death, no more decay, it's over. Way better than some earthly miracle. The prayer of faith guarantees a spiritual miracle. This should never be possible. We should not be able to be with Jesus for eternity. We were infected with sin, but Jesus, the great physician, has healed us for eternity that we don't have to be quarantined from him, but rather that we might live with him, pure, healed from the virus of sin. You see, verse 15 never guaranteed physical healing because James had a far greater healing in mind. In fact, the last half of verse 15, he says this, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. If you are sick, deathly ill, as it would seem in this passage, then get the elders together, have them pray for you. If, if you are a part of the church, if you have been saved by Jesus, and if you have faith, your sins are forgiven and you can have life with Jesus. James guarantees that you will be saved and your sins will be forgiven. When eternity is looming closely and you know your time is short, maybe these thoughts of doubt creep into your head about eternity or fear. Call the elders of the church. Let them pray. If you are God's child, the comfort is that he has made a guarantee of salvation even though we were born sinners and have rebelled against Jesus. Verse 16, Therefore, so, therefore, because of this great guarantee of salvation by faith, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. So, because of this guarantee of eternal healing, salvation of our souls, because of this guarantee that by faith we will be saved into his kingdom, we ought to pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another. It helps us to realize our own inability to save ourselves and pray for one another, understanding that it is the one that we pray to that has the power to save. There are those who are considered righteous, those who understand their own weakness and trust in Jesus and his death and resurrection for their salvation. Those are who are considered the righteous people and the prayer of the righteous is powerful, James says, not because the person is powerful or good or pure, but because the one they trust for their salvation, the one they trust for their righteousness, the one that they love and the one that they serve is powerful enough to defeat death and heal us eternally. Jesus has shown us his power on the cross. Death could not keep him down. Satan could not win the battle. Jesus rose again. So pray to the one who defeated death that you might also defeat death and have eternal life. Pray to this God, the one who made the impossible possible, the one who changed your future of death and punishment to grace and mercy and life eternal. Verses 17 and 18. James says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. James sort of puts an exclamation mark on this point by using the example of the Old Testament prophet, the one who was considered righteous. The majority of the original readers, they would have been from Jewish descent, and they would have known of this prophet Elijah. He was a hero of the faith from like a thousand years earlier. They would have learned about him in their schools. And as, as kids, they would have known about him. He was one of the major prophets of the Jewish religious tradition. And some amazing miracles had been performed by God through this Elijah. He had prayed for a few years of drought upon Israel, and it was to punish the, an evil and wicked king and his people during a particularly bad time in Israel's history. And it was so. There was drought for years. Then he prayed for rain. And it rained. God answered his prayer. And James reminds these people that Elijah wasn't just some special guy. He, he was just like you and I. So the, the power of the prayers that we pray, the power of healing doesn't lie in ourselves, but rather in the God that we pray to. Our faith in this God grows the more that we know him and the more faith that we have in him. And the more we understand that he will do as he says he will do. And that's how we can be assured that the prayer of faith can save the one who is sick. We have to remember that the people that this was written 
to were believers in Jesus. He was writing this to the church. He's reminding them, hey, if somebody's deathly ill or injured, don't despair. They're in Christ and they are saved by faith, by the prayer of faith. And God is faithful in saving those who are his. The prayer of faith will save the one who is ill. God has promised to save those who are his. He has promised eternal healing for those who are his. And he follows through with his promises and he fulfills them. Confess your sins, pray for one another that you might have faith in Jesus, that you might be healed with healing that far surpasses any earthly healing that you might ever experience. This is a healing that guarantees you will never die again, so much superior to an earthly healing where you must once again die. This healing is a healing that heals our souls so that our sin is cured and we might be declared pure that we might spend eternity with Jesus Christ and God the Father. Jesus has paid for this cure. He has made a way for us to be with him. This is the good news of the gospel. And this is a guarantee. Jesus will save those who by faith confess that they are sinners and that they have rebelled against God. And they have no way of fixing the sickness of sin on their own. He will save those who believe in him. Those who believe that he is the ultimate cure for the sickness the virus of sin. This is God's promise, so let's rejoice in this. If we experience earthly healing in this world, let us rejoice in that. Let us worship God for that. But if we have experienced eternal healing from, from the disease of sin, let's find far greater joy in that this morning. Jesus has done it for us. This is good news. Will you believe that today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for healing this morning. We pray for the physical healing of those who are sick. We pray for comfort for those who are experiencing pain. We know that you can and do answer prayer and you do have the power to heal. And so we pray for it. But even more importantly than that today, we, we want to pray for those who are infected with the disease of sin, those who cannot save themselves and have no hope. I pray that we as the church would be that beacon of hope, showing them the good news of the gospel, praying for those who are lost and trusting you to save your children. Our prayers don't hold power because they are great prayers, but rather it's because the one we pray to is great. And so we worship you for that this morning. Amen.